Chapter 6. Roots. I had attended on a John Mond for six months at Pur Forest when he received a letter from Venerable Chao Kun Damachedi, the abbot of Bodhisompurn Monastery and the chief administrative monk of the entire northeast province of Udon Thani. In his letter Chao Kun Damachedi, who had been a disciple of Ajahn Mond since his youth, invited him to return to Udon Thani and settle in that region for the benefit of his many disciples there. Ajahn Mond had been born in the Lao-speaking northeast region of Thailand, of which Udon Thani is a part, and had spent many years wandering through its vast wilderness areas that border the Mekong River. Known colloquially as Yi San, Thailand's northeast region was the homeland of many forest monks of that era and the birthplace of the Thai forest tradition. By the time he received Chao Kun Damachedi's letter, Ajahn Mond had been living and practicing in the northern province of Chiang Mai for over twelve years. Interestingly enough, a short time before the letter arrived, he had expressed a desire to return home, citing a wish to make his teachings available to a larger group of forest monks. Due to the remoteness of the northern region, only the most intrepid monks had managed to find him there and their numbers were fairly small compared to the many devoted disciples he had left behind when he moved to the north. Ajahn Mond felt the time was right to reconnect with them in order to consolidate the Thai forest Sangha and ensure its longevity as a beacon of hope for future generations. In the past, Ajahn Mond had received many such invitations from Chao Kun Damachedi, but he had never answered those letters or accepted the requests. He was still considering this new request when Chao Kun Damachedi suddenly showed up at Pur Forest to invite him in person. He had traveled from Udon Thani to the isolated region where Ajahn Mond lived to speak with him personally, and thus give Ajahn Mond a chance to answer all his previous letters. Ajahn Mond smiled and said, I've received all the letters you sent, but I didn't answer them because they were small and insignificant compared to your arrival here today. Now I am prepared to honor your request. Chao Kun Damachedi then formally invited Ajahn Mond to return to Udon Thani, a province where he had once lived many years before. He informed Ajahn Mond that he was offering this invitation on behalf of his disciples there, who missed his inspirational presence. Having received Ajahn Mond's consent, Chao Kun Damachedi suggested they set a timetable for his trip to Udon Thani. Due to Ajahn Mond's age and declining health, they deemed it wise that he travel the long distance by train. After a brief discussion, they decided on a departure date at the beginning of May that year, 1940. Ajahn Mond laughed like a lovable and distinguished elder statesman after the agreement was reached. Despite his obvious physical frailty, in that moment his appearance had an ageless quality. A master of the unconditioned Dhamma, he radiated warmth and vitality, while his demeanor displayed sublime elegance and grace. By his very presence, Ajahn Mond lent a clear sense of spiritual purpose to every occasion. People from all walks of life were naturally attracted to his aura of compassion and wisdom, which beckoned them to approach him and engage in conversation. These distinctive qualities are what I call aging gracefully. People who never attempt to practice meditation usually feel distraught when they recognize the telltale signs of aging and decline in their bodies and minds. They are unsettled when facing a loss of physical strength that leaves them unable to manage their own affairs. Those who pride themselves on their intellect are shocked when their sight and hearing decline and their mental faculties become dull and confused. Watching their physical and mental powers waste away frightens those who have spent their lives actively engaged in affairs of the world. For most people, aging is a cruel reminder of life's natural limitations. No matter how well they take care of their physical and mental well-being, both body and mind are bound to let them down in the end and cause them great discomfort. Without spiritual well-being to uplift their hearts and minds, they face the inevitability of death with fear and trepidation. 
Good health, a happy family life, wealth, and prosperity are the primary goals that most people pursue. Such mundane achievements are regarded by most as reliable sources of happiness. In their rush to find happiness in these ways, many people neglect to make a habit of giving generously, of adhering strictly to basic moral precepts, or of developing firm spiritual principles by practicing meditation. They fail to understand that these fundamental virtues are the true sources of happiness. Once old age sets in, the short-lived and hollow nature of their commonplace forms of happiness can take the elderly by surprise. As they cling futilely to the ebb and flow of the memories and experiences that make up their disappearing past, they are left to regret many unfulfilled aims and ambitions. This predicament is what I call mundane aging. In contrast, elderly practitioners who throughout their lives practice warm-hearted generosity maintain a high level of moral virtue, and develop their minds with meditation will amass a storehouse of inner worth sufficient to guide them along the noble path to the end of all suffering. The highest levels of Dhamma are within their reach. The noble virtues of such elderly practitioners are lauded and respected by devas and humans alike. They are no longer attached to their physical appearance or their intellectual capabilities nor do they feel lonely and isolated from the world around them. Some elderly practitioners even succeed in completely extinguishing the fires of greed, aversion, and delusion during their lifetime and pass away in a state of perfect purity. Like Ajahn Mond, for example. Their spiritual purity shines like a beacon of Dhamma, illuminating the hearts and minds of Buddhist practitioners the world over while their loving-kindness radiates in every direction, bringing peace and contentment to living beings of all realms of existence. This serenity is what I call supramundane aging. Witnessing these supreme virtues in Ajahn Mond's animated presence, while he conversed with Chao Kun Damachedi in the manner of a loving father reconnecting with his long-lost son, was a heartwarming sight. How rare it is in today's world to witness such a close and harmonious companionship. Rejoicing at the wonderful scene unfolding before me, I suddenly realized that monks who are truly sons of the Buddha possess the power to pass on the true spirit of the Dhamma to their disciples. The night we arrived at Chedi Luang Monastery, a large group of terrestrial devas paid a nocturnal visit to Ajahn Mond as he sat in meditation and pleaded with him to remain in the north for the benefit of the deva population there. Reluctant to see him leave, they insisted that devas from all realms experienced peace and contentment from the power of the loving-kindness emanating from his presence. They were loath to see him leave, for they feared their sense of contentment would soon fade in his absence. Even their social harmony might be affected. Ajahn Mon told them that, having accepted an invitation and given his word, he was obliged to leave as planned. As a monk, he was duty-bound to honor his promise and remain true to his word. If he went back on a promise, his virtue would soon evaporate and his worth as a monk would diminish. He made it clear to them that a monk must preserve his moral integrity at all costs. Ajahn Mond remained at Chedi Luang Monastery for about one week. During that time, a large group of his local devotees came to try to persuade him to extend his stay in Chiang Mai for the benefit of the people living there. Repeating the response he had given to the terrestrial devas, he insisted that, having accepted the invitation to go to Udon Thani, he could not further delay his departure. After remaining several more days at Chedi Luang Monastery, Ajahn Mon and I departed on our journey to the northeast. As there was no direct railway line from Chiang Mai to Udon Thani in those days, our first stop would be Bangkok. Somdet Maha Wirawong, one of the highest-ranking monks in the country, accompanied by other senior monks and a large group of lay supporters, escorted Ajahn Mon from the monastery to the train station. 
Also present on that occasion was a multitude of celestial devas. Ajahn Mon told me that the devas who came to escort him to the train station filled the sky around us in every direction. They hovered patiently in midair after he reached the station, waiting to send him off before returning to their respective celestial realms. On the ground, a hectic scene unfolded as Ajahn Mon greeted the scores of monks and lay people who were gathered to see him off, while at the same time intentionally bestowing his blessing on all the devas who hovered above. In the end, he was not able to focus his undivided attention on the devas and give them his final blessing until after he'd finished speaking to all the people gathered there and the train had begun pulling away from the station. Ajahn Mond felt compassion for the devas who held him in such high esteem. They showed the same signs of sadness and distress that human beings do when parting with a close relative. Some continued to hover behind the train as it sped down the tracks, until eventually Ajahn Mon felt it necessary to tell them to return to their celestial realms. They obeyed reluctantly, wondering if he would ever bless them with his presence again. Upon our arrival in Bangkok, we took up residence at Boromaniwat Monastery, at the personal request of Somdet Maha Wirawong. As usual, I served Ajahn Mond by arranging the lodgings to suit his needs, fetching water from the well for bathing, preparing his drinking water, sweeping his room, and taking care of his bowl and robes. During our stay in Bangkok, many people came to discuss the Dhamma with Ajahn Mond. Those discussions often centered on issues of moral virtue, which he addressed as follows. Practicing moral virtue requires keeping your actions and speech in good order. But before you can put your actions and speech in proper moral order, you must ascertain where the intentions behind these activities originate. They begin with the master of body and speech, the mind, which determines the moral quality of your behavior. Once you have established that the mind is the causal factor, you must learn the ways in which your intentions regulate action and speech so that these activities remain blameless in all circumstances and are thus a source of well-being for yourself and others. In this manner, the mind supervises the performance of every activity you engage in to ensure that your actions produce virtuous results every time. Safeguarding morality requires the mind to be skilled at controlling its intentions. Lack of such control will result in a stained moral fabric that is patchy and full of holes. The key to moral integrity is mindful awareness of your thoughts, coupled with the recognition of which urges are appropriate to act on and which are not. Pay attention to how you express yourself by way of body, speech, and mind. By monitoring these three behaviors so that actions stay within the confines of what is morally acceptable, you can be confident that your behavior will always be exemplary and never damaging or offensive. Apart from such exemplary supervision of body, speech, and mind, it's difficult to define what genuine moral virtue is, since it's impossible to separate its practice from the mind of the person who maintains it. Morality and the mind are not distinct entities like a house and its owner, so it's impossible to distinguish between moral virtue and the mental attitude that produces it. Further, the peace of mind resulting from the practice of moral precepts cannot be separated from the virtuous actions that created it. They are all bound up together. Those who understand these principles and practice accordingly remain content in all circumstances, for they never worry about lapses in their virtuous intentions. When he felt the time was appropriate, Ajahn Mondnai boarded the passenger train that traveled from Bangkok to Udon Thani. We stopped first at Korat, the capital of Nakhon Ratchasima, which was considered the gateway to the Lao-speaking northeastern region. Lay devotees who wanted to make his acquaintance had asked Ajahn Mon to briefly stop over there. We stayed for several days at Sala One Forest Monastery, where Ajahn Mon received numerous visitors who came to ask him questions about meditation practice. On one occasion, he answered questions from late morning until nightfall. 
a question I still remember concerned Ajahn Mon's reason for journeying to Nakon Rachasima. Was his purpose to seek seclusion and strive for Nibbana? His response was striking. Being neither hungry nor deluded, I'm not searching for anything to create suffering or cause myself trouble. Restless and hungry people are never content with what they have. They run around creating difficulties here and there, doing whatever they please without considering if their behavior is morally correct or not. In the end, that restless hunger consumes their hearts like a blazing fire. Deluded people are always searching for wealth, status, praise, and pleasure. The wise, however, have ceased searching. Everything is already perfect within their hearts, so why should they waste their time looking for more? Why should they eagerly grasp at shadows when they know perfectly well that shadows are illusory? The Four Noble Truths are real, and they display themselves constantly within the minds and bodies of all living beings. Having fully understood those truths, I myself am no longer deluded and thus have nothing further to seek. As long as I am still alive and people need my help, I will do my best to assist them. It's as simple as that. The Buddha taught that we are always subject to the law of cause and effect, which is to say the law of Kama. A cornerstone of his teachings says that where there is birth, there is also death, that actions bring consequences. In everyday life, even people who do not think carefully about actions and their consequences still try to produce the causes that bring them good and beneficial results. It is natural for people to want to better their situation and be successful in life. But regardless of what efforts they have made to be successful, at the time of death all their material gains are left behind. All things are like bubbles. They appear and disappear, impermanent and ever-changing. This truth applies not only to human beings, but also to all material things in the world. Everything must go through a time of arising, a time of staying, and a time of passing away. In the case of human beings, we perceive this truth in the process of birth, aging, sickness, and death. Ultimately, the varying results that you experience in life depend on the deeds you have done, and the karmic consequences you have created by the quality of your actions. You have no recourse but to accept the outcomes dictated by your kama. It's for this very reason that living beings differ so widely in everything from the quality of their next life, with its potential for different bodily forms and emotional temperaments, to the degrees of pleasure and pain they experience in that subsequent lifetime. All such consequences form part of their own personal makeup, a personal destiny for which each of them must take full responsibility. They must learn to live with the good and the bad, the pleasant and the painful experiences that come their way, for no one has the power to disown the consequences of their actions. For this reason, you must pay careful attention to your conduct in everyday life. Be wary, lest the intentions behind your behavior become the cause of misfortune and suffering now or in the future. Rather than simply acting on impulse, use discretion to safeguard your prospects of experiencing good fortune. Pay attention to what you are involving yourself in, what you are involving other people in, and how that involvement will affect you in the future. In the end, every action you take results in karmic consequences. Good and bad acts of body, speech, and mind bring their corresponding outcomes, and their cumulative effect will shape your spiritual welfare going forward. So be careful not to unwittingly create a store of unwanted results and a future of unwelcome suffering. Before long, Ajahn Mon and I left Nakhon Rachasima and resumed our journey to Udon Thani. When our train pulled into the bustling station at Kongen, some of Ajahn Mon's relatives who lived in the city were waiting there to greet him. They wished to invite him to disembark and break his journey there. They pleaded with him to stay in Kongen for a while out of compassion for his devotees. Since he was determined to push on to his final destination, he was forced to disappoint his relatives on that occasion. 
When Ajahn Mond and I finally arrived in Udon Thani, we stayed with Chao Kun Damachedi at Bodhisomporn Monastery in the provincial capital. People from the provinces of Nong Kai and Sakon Nakon, in addition to those from Udon Thani, were waiting there to pay respects to him and listen to him expound on the Dhamma. Ajahn Mond soon felt hemmed in on all sides by the crowds of devotees that visited the city monastery. So after several days, he asked Chao Kun Damachedi to take him to a charnel ground somewhere in the jungle surrounding Udon Thani. In his Dutanga travels, Ajahn Mond was always on the lookout for secluded sites where he could set up his umbrella tent and camp out in solitude. He found that charnel grounds were places that naturally encouraged alertness and introspection. After considering the options, Chao Kun Damachedi suggested a site near Non Niwait, which was located in a quiet and undisturbed forested area. It remained secluded because the locals, fearing the wrath of fierce ghosts, did not dare to approach the area. No Ni Waits charnel ground was a place where local villagers discarded the corpses of thieves and murderers, throwing their bodies on the barren earth to decay and attract scavenging animals. As a result, the site provoked fear and dread in the hearts of the villagers. Ajahn Mon and I moved to Nonni Wait, set up our umbrella tents under the shade of the trees bordering the open, corpse-strewn clearing, and settled there to begin the rainy season retreat. Once each week during the retreat that year, Chao Kun Damachedi escorted a group of public officials and other lay supporters from the city to visit Ajahn Mon, listen to his evening Dhamma talks, and ask him questions. I recall one questioner who asked if the attraction felt between a married couple occurs as a result of previous relationships in past lives. Ajahn Mond's reply set the record straight. It is very difficult to know, with any certainty, whether or not our love for this person or our relationship with that person has its roots in a mutual affinity developed over many lifetimes. For the most part, people fall in love and get married rather blindly. Feeling hungry, a person's normal tendency is to reach out and grab some food to satisfy that hunger. They will eat whatever is available if it is sufficient for their day-to-day -day needs. The same can be said for past life associations as well. Although such relationships are a common feature of worldly life, it's not at all easy to find genuine cases of people who fall in love and get married simply due to a long-standing past life association. That's because the emotional defilements which cause people to fall in love don't spare anyone's blushes. And they certainly don't wait patiently to give past life affinities a chance to have a say in the matter first. All those defilements ask is that there is someone of the opposite sex who suits their fancy. That's enough for passion to arise and impulsively grab a hold. Those defiling forces that cause people to fall in love can turn ordinary people into aggressive competitors who will battle to the bitter end without respect for modesty or moderation, no matter what the consequences might be. Even if they realize they've made a mistake, they still refuse to budge. Even the prospect of death cannot make them abandon their unrestrained passions. This self-indulgence is the root of the emotional defilements that cause people to fall in love. Displaying itself conspicuously in people's hearts, such self-indulgence is extremely difficult to control. Chao Kun Damachedi had gone out of his way to invite Ajahn Mon to Udon Thani, trekking for days through the mountains and forests of Chiang Mai to personally present his request. He had always shown a keen interest in the way of practice and never tired of talking about Buddhist principles, no matter how long the conversation lasted. He was especially appreciative when the discussion concerned meditation practice. Because he felt great respect and affection for Ajahn Mon, he took a special interest in his welfare, constantly asking people who had seen Ajahn Mon about the state of his health. In addition, he encouraged people to meet with Ajahn Mon and get to know him, even going so far as to accompany those who did not dare go alone. 
The Dhamma talks that Ajahn Mon gave when monks visited him at Nonni Wait were always inspiring and insightful. A typical talk went like this. Only a monk who is firm in his discipline and respectful of all the training rules can be considered a fully-fledged monk. He does not transgress the minor training rules merely because he considers them to be insignificant. Such negligence by a monk indicates that he feels no shame about improper behavior, a fault which may eventually lead him to commit more serious transgressions. A virtuous monk strictly adheres to the monastic code of discipline to ensure that his behavior is not stained by unsightly blemishes. By doing so, he feels comfortable and confident living among his peers, without concern that his teacher or his fellow monks will have reason to be critical or reproachful. For the inner monk in your heart to reach perfection, you must be steady and relentless in your efforts to attain each successive level of both samadhi and wisdom. The present moment is where your mind must be focused. With your mind anchored in the present, worries and concerns about the past and future drop away, and you cease to send your awareness out to chase after restive thoughts that are disconnected from the present moment. Grounding your mind in the present means being mindful of what is front and center in your awareness at each moment. Well-trained mindfulness has the ability to move effortlessly from moment to moment with the natural spontaneity and fluid momentum gained from cultivating heightened awareness through consistent practice. When you persevere in this practice, skillful mental states will arise naturally and continue to gain strength until they are powerful enough to scrub clean the stains and blemishes that the defilements have produced to pollute your mind. When a monk's conduct is wholly above reproach, his mind will be gladdened by the Dhamma qualities that he cultivates. A monk should never appear dreary or sad nor should he appear undignified shunning his fellow monks because a guilty conscience is troubling his heart. Such negligent behavior runs contrary to the discipline espoused by the Lord Buddha, whose internal conduct and external behavior were both impeccable. To follow in his footsteps, a monk has to muster the courage needed to forsake all forms of evil and instead engage only in good deeds. He must be a man of integrity who is honest with himself and his peers, while being faithful to the Dhamma teachings and the Vinaya rules. His meditation practice will thus be supported by his exemplary behavior wherever he goes. The brightness of his mindfulness and wisdom will light the way to a mind suffused with the essence of Dhamma. He will never again find himself trapped in a dark web of delusion with no means of escape. These are the inner qualities cultivated by a true disciple of the Lord Buddha. Study them carefully and continually bear them in mind. During the dry season months following the rains retreat, Ajahn Mon preferred to hike along footpaths in the surrounding wilderness, seeking secluded locations where he could practice the way of Dhamma in the manner most suited to his temperament. When the time came for us to leave Non Ni Wait's charnel ground and head to the wilderness, Ajahn Mon told me to prepare his belongings for the journey and await his instructions. His modest belongings were limited to the eight basic requisites of a monk a lower robe, an upper robe, an outer robe, an alms bowl, a razor to shave his head, a needle for mending robes, a cloth water strainer, and a waist belt. I quickly packed all his gear with mine. We were now ready to go the moment he gave the command. Once he had, I slung his bowl over one shoulder and mine over the other, and walked behind Ajahn Mond as he headed out. I never asked him about our destination. I simply followed him with a mind fully focused on the path in front of me. Although Ajahn Mond leaned on a wooden staff when he walked, his pace was remarkably fast. After all this time, I can still remember the sound of the quick rhythm of his footfalls on the earthen path. I felt as though I had to run to keep up with him nearly every time we were on the trail. He walked that quickly. That year, we set up camp in the vicinity of Nong Nam Kem village, where we spent several months living and practicing in the village's charnel ground. 
Ajahn Mond liked the location because it was surrounded by a cool, shady forest and situated close to an abundant supply of fresh water. From the years 1939 to 1941, I was the monk who most often accompanied Ajahn Mond on his Dutanga wanderings, which enabled my meditation practice to steadily progress as a result of the teachings he gave me during each outing. I was fortunate to have learned many new things during these excursions. But the training was intense, which forced me to remain sharp-eyed and on the ball at every moment. I had to think on my feet and make quick, sensible decisions in his presence. Otherwise, he wouldn't allow me to stay with him. I observed Ajahn Ma attentively when we were together and listened carefully to his explanations, straining to make out his remarks when he spoke softly careful not to miss any words of wisdom. Through his guidance, I was able to resolve many doubts I had about the Buddha's teachings and their application, for which I've been forever grateful. One evening, as I gently massaged Ajahn Mond's tired limbs at Nong Nam Kem village, he told me a captivating story about an extraordinary vision that arose in his meditation while he was living deep in a mountainous region of Chiang Mai. The hour was 3 a.m., a time when his body elements were especially subtle. He had just awoken from sleep and was sitting calmly in meditation when he noticed that his mind wanted to rest in complete tranquility. He quickly entered a state of deep samadhi and remained there for about two hours. As his mind withdrew from that state and began returning to normal waking consciousness, it paused at the level of access concentration. There, he became aware of certain events unfolding in his mind's eye. In his vision, a huge elephant walked up to Ajahn Mond and knelt before him, indicating it wanted him to mount. Ajahn Mond promptly climbed onto its back and sat straddling its neck. Once he was settled on the elephant, he noticed two other elephants following behind him, both carrying young monks on their backs. The elephants were also very large, though slightly smaller than the one Ajahn Mon was riding. The three elephants appeared very handsome and majestic, like royal elephants that possess human-like intelligence and intimately know their master's wishes. When the other two elephants reached him, he led them toward a mountain range that was visible in the distance. Ajahn Mon felt the whole scene to be exceptionally majestic, as though he were escorting the two young monks away from the perpetual cycle of birth and death. Upon reaching the mountain range, his elephant led them all to the entrance of a cave that was recessed into a hillside a short distance up the mountain. As soon as they arrived, his elephant turned around, placing its rear toward the entrance. With Ajahn Mond still straddling its neck, it backed into the cave until its rear end touched the back wall. The other two elephants with the two young monks astride walked forward into the cave. Each then stood in place on opposite sides of Ajahn Mond's elephant, facing inward as his faced outward. Ajahn Mond then spoke to the two monks as if he were giving them his final parting instructions. I have reached my final hour of birth in a human body. Perpetual existence in the conventional world will soon cease altogether for me. Never again shall I return to the world of living and dying. I want you both to continue your monastic lives and develop your minds to the fullest extent possible. Before long, you will follow in my footsteps and depart this world in the same manner as I am preparing to do now. Escaping from the world of sentient existence, with its clinging attachments and its agonizing pain and suffering, is an extremely difficult task that demands unwavering commitment. You must pour every ounce of energy into the struggle to prevail in this noble endeavor, including facing the threshold of death, before you can expect to attain complete freedom from craving and delusion. Once freed, you will never again fear death, nor will you grasp again at future birth and experience further death as a result. Having completely transcended even the slightest attachments, I shall depart this world unfettered, much like a captive released from bondage. Unlike people whose desperate clinging to life causes them immense suffering at the time of death, I have no regrets whatsoever 
about letting go of sentient existence for good. Therefore you should not mourn my passing, for nothing good will come of it. Such grief merely promotes an increase of defilements in the mind, which the wise have never encouraged. When he finished speaking, Ajahn Mon told the two young monks to back their elephants out of the cave. Both elephants had been standing perfectly still, one on either side, as though they too were listening to Ajahn Mon's parting words and mourning his imminent departure. In that moment, all three elephants resembled real, living animals rather than visual images. At his command, the elephants carrying the young monks slowly backed out of the cave, all the while facing Ajahn Mond with their regally dignified demeanors. Then, as Ajahn Mond sat astride its neck, his elephant began to bore its hindquarters into the cave wall to its rear. When half of the elephant's body had penetrated the wall of the cave, Ajahn Mond's mind began to withdraw from Samadhi, bringing an end to the vision. Having never experienced such an unusual vision before, Ajahn Mon analyzed it and understood its meaning to be twofold. Firstly, when he died, two young monks would attain full enlightenment after his demise, though he didn't specify who they were. Secondly, the vision demonstrated the abiding importance of both Sammata and Vipassana meditation. The Sammata approach to meditation encompasses practices like the stages of Samadhi, that aim to achieve mental calm and concentration. Vipassana focuses on practices such as body contemplation that foster insight into the true nature of suffering and its causes. Ajahn Man clearly understood the benefits that an arahant gains from practicing both of these modes of meditation from the time he attains enlightenment until the time of his death. During that period of his life, he must rely on some mata and vipassana to be his dhamma abodes. These abodes are experienced as spheres of blissful abiding here and now that help to ease the tension that occurs between the liberated mind and the five mundane aggregates, both of which remain interdependent until the moment when the mundane aggregates and the transcendent mind go their separate ways at the time of death. After an arahant passes away, some mata and vipassana cease to function and disappear like all other conditioned phenomena. Ajahn Mon was heartened to know that two young monks would realize the highest dhamma around the time of his death, either just before or soon after. He said it was very strange that, in his parting instructions to them, he spoke about his own impending death as though his time had already come. When Ajahn Mond finished speaking, he remained silent. I continued waiting expectantly, eager to hear him reveal the names of those two young monks. But he didn't say another word. Of all the great meditation monks I've lived and practiced with, I admired and respected Ajahn Mond the most. He was, without question, the most outstanding teacher I had ever met. Living and studying under his guidance for many years, I never saw him act contrary to the Dhamma or the Vinaya. His behavior was in complete harmony with the Buddha's teachings, and it never caused his students to doubt him. From my observations, he faithfully kept to the straight and narrow path of those noble disciples who practice rightly and truly. He never strayed from that path in the slightest. When Ajahn Mon described the beginning stages of his practice, he spoke about his effort to develop mindfulness and his preference for living alone. When he lived with other monks, their social conduct could hinder his meditation progress. When living on his own, he found that all his activities were infused with mindfulness and wisdom, which enabled his mind to fully engage in meditation practice all the time. Early in his monastic career, Ajahn Mon resolved never to return to this world of continued death and rebirth. No matter how much time and effort were required, he was determined to gain release from suffering in this lifetime and never be born again. He regarded his birth in the world of human affairs as a cause for dismay. When he saw the effects of birth, 
aging, sickness, and death experienced by all classes of living beings, it only increased his dismay and strengthened his motivation to seek complete freedom from suffering before he died. Wherever he lived, he resolved to diligently practice the Buddha's teachings. He desired nothing that might delay his release from suffering. Ajahn Man spent years trekking alone through forests and mountains in search of secluded places that offered body and mind a calm, quiet environment in which to practice meditation. For the most part, he lived entirely outdoors, at the mercy of the elements and the vagaries of the weather. His daily life was full of forests and mountains, rivers and streams, caves, overhanging cliffs, and dangerous wild animals. Normally, he didn't remain in the same place for more than a single rains retreat. When the rainy season ended, he wandered peacefully through wilderness areas like a bird burdened only by its wings, free to fly wherever it wished. Ajahn Mon preferred living in the wilderness because the environment was not only spiritually challenging, but also free from worldly distractions. Camped in the wilds, he could push his practice to the limit without being sidetracked by less important issues. Wherever he cast his glance, whatever he contemplated, his ultimate purpose was at the forefront, fostering a clear sense of direction in his meditation. Through his own heroic efforts, Ajahn Mond became keenly aware of the practical value that Dutanga observances had for practicing monks. He clearly understood that each of these practices is a very effective means of closing off the outlets through which a monk's mental defilements tend to flow. He could see that each ascetic practice promoted specific virtuous qualities, while its observance reminded a monk not to carelessly think in ways that contradicted the very virtue he was trying to develop. Always on guard, a dedicated Dutanga monk immediately became aware of any lapses in judgment and resolved to remedy those failures in the future. In addition to teaching the Dutangas to his students, Ajahn Mond taught a variety of meditation methods, all of which were completely in line with the practical teachings of the Buddha. For example, he taught the recollection of the Buddha and mindfulness of breathing as a means of producing peace and tranquility in the heart. He taught the four foundations of mindfulness and body contemplation for developing wisdom. He instructed his disciples to probe deeply to discover the truth about birth, aging, sickness, and death, showing them how to uproot the real causes of suffering from their minds. And he guided them every step of the way with precise instructions and timely advice. Because of his compassionate efforts, many monks of his lineage were able to attain an extraordinary level of success in their meditation. Ajahn Man taught his disciples that if they aimed to become firmly established in the practice, they must be willing to put everything on the line to achieve that goal, both their bodies and their minds. Everything except their mindful focus must be sacrificed for the sake of attaining the ultimate Dhamma. Even their lives should not be exempted. Whatever happened, nature should be allowed to take its course. Everyone who is born must die. Nothing is gained from trying to resist that inevitability. Truth cannot be found by denying the natural order of things. Instead, a monk must be resolute and brave in the face of death. Ajahn Man was particularly vocal when encouraging his disciples to live in isolated wilderness areas teeming with wild animals, places where they came face to face with challenges that would motivate them to discover the virtues of meditation for themselves. The demanding nature of such environments encouraged serious practitioners to reflect inwardly and find within themselves a safe refuge, an inner space where external perils could not threaten their mental equilibrium. Discovering this inner refuge required great courage, skill, and strength of mind. For Ajahn Man, regularly maintaining that attitude meant pursuing the life of a homeless wanderer intent on renunciation and solitude. Having renounced the world and gone forth from home, he wore robes made from discarded cloth, depended on alms for food, and took the forest as his dwelling place. 
from the day he first ordained until the last day of his life. His entire lifestyle and the example he set for his disciples were modeled on the principles of fewness of wishes and contentment with little. Ajahn Mond's lifestyle personified contentment with the absolute minimum. When he walked to a village to collect food offerings, he didn't harbor expectations about what kind of food he would receive, nor did he verbally solicit alms from the inhabitants. If he received generous offerings of food, he felt fortunate. If he received little food, or occasionally no food, that was fine too. His hunger never conflicted with the Dhamma in his heart. For most of his adult life, his diet consisted of rice and water, with small pieces of fish and some forest greens thrown in to add flavor. Afternoon refreshments like coffee and sugar were largely unavailable. In his old age, Ajahn Mond became a highly respected and famous senior monk, one who deserved the best food and the most comfortable lodgings. But a lifestyle of ease did not suit his temperament. Instead, he insisted on camping in remote wilderness areas where the local farmers, who were themselves very poor, shared with him what little they could grow on small plots of sloping mountain land. Ajahn Mond found cloth to make and mend his robes in places where people threw away bits of old clothing, along the roadside in refuse heaps or at cremation sites. He picked up pieces of cloth that were soiled, wrinkled, and faded. Although they might appear tattered, when sewn together they produced a robe that was just enough to cover his body and protect it from the elements. He often slept on the ground, making his bedding of gathered leaves and his pillow of a folded robe. Using his outer robe for a blanket and the shade of a tree for a roof, he relied on this simple shelter wherever he traveled. Ajahn Man used Dhamma's curative powers as his medical remedy of choice. When they were made available to him, he occasionally used the medicinal fruits, leaves, or tubers which grew wild in the forest. He took these traditional medicines either pickled in fermented cow's urine or boiled in plain water as a concoction. By caring for himself in these ways, he remained healthy in body and mind. Ajahn Mond's mind was powerful and all-encompassing, while his behavior was humble and unassuming. He believed in sacrificing his own interests to help others in need. When he received gifts of monks' requisites from lay supporters, he invariably left those articles behind when he departed so that other monks and novices could make use of them. He never hoped to gain more, nor did he fear going without. He neither sought pleasant experiences nor shied away from painful ones. Neither praise nor criticism aroused strong feelings. The beliefs and opinions that people expressed about him did not affect his serene state of mind. His mind was aware of everything, but attached to nothing. The sum of his wanting was next to nothing. The objects of his dispassion were nearly everything. Ajahn Mond possessed a mastery of psychic skills concerning all aspects of sentient phenomena. Over the years, his proficiency grew to such an extent that it seemed to have no limits. Because the monks living with him were aware of his extraordinary abilities, they took extra precautions to make sure they always remained mindfully self-controlled. They couldn't afford to let their minds wander carelessly, lest their errant thoughts become the subject of a Dhamma talk at the evening meeting. Giving helpful advice to non-physical beings from many diverse realms of existence was a responsibility that Ajahn Mon continued to take very seriously right up to the time of his death. He was in constant communication with such beings wherever he lived, though those interactions occurred most often in the mountainous regions of the north. During the years that he lived in those remote wilderness areas, far from human habitation, one group or another visited him almost every night. Aware that living beings throughout the sentient universe share a common heritage of birth-aging sickness and death, and a universal desire to avoid suffering and gain happiness, Ajahn Man understood the benefit they received from hearing teachings on Dhamma as a means of fulfilling their spiritual potential and attaining enduring happiness. Because he possessed the eye of wisdom, 
he made no fundamental distinction between the hearts of people and the hearts of devas. He did, however, tailor his teaching to fit their individual circumstances and levels of understanding. Ajahn Mon could know things both apparent and hidden, including knowledge of the past and future. Although he displayed this ability on numerous occasions, his actions never concealed ulterior or worldly motives. His spoken words were derived from his own knowledge and insights, and expressed to make people reflect on their essential meaning. His eloquent discourses clarified the principles of Dhamma in a way that left no room for doubt, which made listening to his talks an inspiring learning experience. His teachings were fresh and invigorating, never stale or boring. He spoke of common, everyday things, things we saw and heard all the time, but never paid close attention to until he mentioned them. His teachings employed a full range of expression, sometimes casual, sometimes serious, and sometimes forceful when stressing specific points. He could analyze the disparate aspects of the Buddha's teachings and articulate them in a way that deeply affected his audience. I, myself, asked him questions about meditation problems that I couldn't solve on my own, and I always benefited from the wisdom of his answers. I was impressed by the fact that a John Mond's advice never deviated from the path of practice taught by the Lord Buddha. For this reason, I became absolutely convinced that he was one of the Lord Buddha's present-day Arahant disciples. Courageous and masterful in the way he lived his life, he was never in danger of succumbing to the power of greed, hatred, or delusion. Even in old age, when he could have been expected to rest and take it easy because he no longer needed to exert himself in meditation practice, he still did as much walking meditation as he always had. So much, in fact, that the younger monks struggled to match his exertions. Never losing hope in his students' potential for enlightenment, Ajahn Man fulfilled his teaching obligations with great compassion. His powerful words reflected his resolute character, and he invariably used the rhetoric of a warrior to inspire courage in his disciples. He delivered his talks with the force of his convictions, aiming to arouse in his monks the strength and tenacity needed to completely transcend craving in all its guises. He never compromised his principles or made allowances for his students' shortcomings. Instead, he relentlessly pushed his disciples toward the threshold of the deathless Dhamma.